All right, as we still have a couple people joining us and logging on, um, I'm gonna take a second to welcome everyone and introduce myself. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. I have a couple housekeeping reminders to share with you since we're all in one giant Zoom call. Um, I want to just invite people to turn their um, video on. We'd love to see your faces. We do have you all muted and we'll leave it that way until we open it up to questions at the end. And of course you can use the chat to ask questions as well. Um, that said, we will be recording this and the way that it looks on my screen is the way that it will show up in the recording. So uh, just keep that in mind as you choose to turn your camera on or to keep it off. Again, thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation this evening with artist Shirley Brocker. Brocker I'm so sorry, I should have asked how to pronounce. Brocker. Brocker. And Jonathan Thunder and Jason Quigno. Uh, we had planned to have this conversation moderated by Jonathan Minor, which you may have seen in the, um, in the description for the event. And if he joins us later, he'll be jumping in too. Uh, in the meantime, I'll be asking all of these lovely artists questions. My name is Amanda Rainey. I'm with the GVSU Art Gallery, who's a co-sponsor of this event, alongside the Muskegon Museum of Art and GVSU's Office of Multicultural Affairs, who are utilizing their Native American Heritage Celebration Funds to help sponsor this event. Um, just a reminder to any GVSU students that this program is INT 100 and 200 approved. All right. We are so thrilled, all of us at the MMA and the OMA at GVSU and the Art Gallery here at Grand Valley for all of your interest in this exhibition, The Art of the People, Contemporary Anishinaabe Artists, which was guest curated by Jason Quignell. Thank you, Jason. And is now on view at the GVSU Art Gallery in the Haas Center for Performing Arts, where I'm standing this evening and at the Muskegon Museum of Art. Both those, these exhibitions are on view through the end of February. Um, I'd like to begin by reading a statement acknowledging the land upon which this gallery was built. The GVSU Art Gallery would like to recognize the people of the three fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples on whose land we are gathered. The three fires people are indigenous to this land, which means that this is their ancestral territory. Every university is built on stolen native land. We are guests on their land and one way to practice right relations is to develop genuine ways to acknowledge the histories and traditions of the people who originated here first, who are still here and who tend to the land always. We make this land acknowledgement. We know it is but an important <clears throat> first step and that there are many more ways uh, that we need, many more things that we need to do to engage in the important work of social justice. The GVSU Art Gallery pledges to provide indigenous artists with the platform to share their talents, artwork, and stories. We pledge to appropriately collect, exhibit, and care for indigenous made artwork and objects. And we pledge to create an environment where the history and traditions of artists indigenous to this area can be recognized and celebrated, which brings us here tonight. So I would like to briefly introduce each of these artists. I just want to take a moment to find their bios because someone else was originally going to read these. I apologize for the delay. All right. So if you are, if you are um, watching this and you are able to see Shirley's work, this is who I am going to introduce first. So Shirley is, um, she works in drawing, painting, clay and bronze. Shirley combines images and leg with legends of the past with contemporary materials of the present to keep storytelling traditions alive. 
Shirley received her Master's of Arts and Bachelor's of Fine Arts degrees from Central Michigan University and was awarded an honorary PhD from CMU in 2015. And she also uh, gave the commencement speech at that ceremony. She also attended the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and has received numerous awards, fellowships, and other recognitions. Thank you, Shirley, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Jonathan Thunder from the Red Lake Ojibwe Nation in Northern Minnesota, infuses his Ojibwe perspectives with real-time experiences using a wide range of mediums, including large-scale painting, animated films, and installations in which he addresses themes of loss and recovery of indigenous sovereignty, environmental welfare, and humorous social commentary. He has attended the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe and the Art Institute International in Minneapolis. Jonathan Thunder is the recipient of a 2020 Pollock Krasner Foundation Award for painting. Congrats on that. And thank you for joining us, Jonathan. Thank you, miigwech. And Jason Quigno is a sculptor and member of the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, Anishinaabe. He served as guest curator for this exhibition. He works in a variety of stone, granite, basalt, marble, limestone, and alabaster, transforming raw blocks into flowing forms. His work has garnered significant recognition and awards, and he's completed numerous public commissions for communities and institutions around Michigan. Thank you, Jason, for joining us. Hello. Just going to quickly scroll through some of the artist's work that we'll be looking at. Jonathan's work. And I will kick this off uh, with our first question. So each of you, if you could tell us about your background and your work, and I'll keep scrolling through your work as you're speaking. So Shirley, if you'd like to kick things off. Okay, sure. Um, I'd like to start out by saying Ani Niji Buju Akina Debik Gizas Makwa Indigenikas Makwa Dodum. And that's uh, sort of protocol for the native people to greet you and to give us our names in our Indian language. And what I said was, hello friends, greetings all. Um, my native name is Moon Bear, which is actually translated as bear of the nighttime sun. And I'm from the bear clan. And I'm a, like, I, like you said earlier, I'm a member of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. And I spend most of my time working in clay. Um, that's my main medium. And um, also in the last few years, I've picked up doing ledger art. And I also do uh, beadwork and leather work and dolls and linoleum block prints. So I've got an array of um, different things that I like to work with. Um, the piece that you're looking at right now is called, well, this is the Missing and Murdered series that I've been doing. And I've done a couple of the pots like this. Um, this one, they're both different, but they carry the same theme. Um, and if you look at this really close, you can see like there's flowers and floral work at the top. And the little red ones are shaped like hands, which represent the hands that we've seen across the native women's faces to signify the silence that's been carried on with this uh, terrible epidemic that's happening to native women all across the country. And in the background, you'll see the painting, uh, it's a drawing, actually a, a ledger drawing. It's on 1893, I think it is, uh, ledger paper. And it's done with Prisma colors. And it also shows the native women ascending up into the heavens. And they're wearing the red dresses because we think that the creator can see the red, the color red, and he will know that we need help down here. And there's a braid of sweet grass going across the bottom, signifying what they're leaving behind. And there's like um, close to 6,000 cases that have been reported um, that have been in this, involved in this missing or murdered um, dilemma. Thank you, Shirley. Moving on to, uh, I think we were going to go with Jason next. Can you share us a little about yourself and uh, your creative practice? Yeah, uh, 
Abuju, Nishma Kade, Makwa, and Dijnakaz, Makwa, and Dodem. Since uh, Shirley introduced herself, I thought I'd better introduce myself in that way, too. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been uh, carving stone for the past 30 years. I started at the age of 14. Uh, my mother forced me into a sculpture class on my res where I grew up. Uh, they had a class for tribal youth at the time for like junior high and high school. And I, I took it and been obsessed ever since. And then I worked under uh, uh, Dan Mena for three years as an apprentice and then kind of set out on my own. And I worked in stone mainly, like to dabble in wood. And now my recent thing is I like to take pictures with my iPhone. It's kind of enjoyable. And I work all types of stone uh, from very hard quartz and granite to medium uh, limestone and marble to soft alabaster and soapstone. Um, this uh, this uh, it kind of what I'm doing. Well, when I started carving stone, I didn't expect it to be a career. It kind of turned into a full blown career. Started out with small little sculptures. I'd hustle yeah. off to my teachers and uh, family members. And um, as I grew, I started, and now I'm doing monumental works in granite that uh, universities and museums, cities and major private collectors have them now. It's even brought me to Japan before. So it's, real, it's been a good journey so far. That's very impressive. Thank you. Jonathan, would you like to share with us about your work? Yeah, absolutely. Buju, Mani Dugui, Wazans, and Dishnikaz, Ojibwe Mong, Jonathan Thunder, Indigo, Jaganashamon, Miskwagamiwi, Zagae Gunning, and Bunjaba, and Makwa Endo Dame also. So, What's up, clan cousins? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess a uh, little bit about my work. <clears throat> I started out, I think, really interested in uh, creative writing and um, have always been a visual thinker. So I got into uh, comic strips really young, which um, kind of made me a fan of, you know, like uh, comic book style cartoons um, and not necessarily, you know, the kind that are just for kids, but uh, maybe the kind that are just for adults too. And um, later moved on to uh, painting. You know, I started studying painting and I think that sort of carried into my, my approach to painting. And uh, I guess I, uh, at some point realized that I wanted to take the stories that were in my paintings just a little further. So I went to school for uh, visual effects, motion graphics, animation, filmmaking. And um, that led me into experimental filmmaking and uh, what I like to call my digital canvases, which are when I will take a painting or you know an image that I, I kind of come up with, and then I'll bring it to that next level where I'll animate it using uh, digital effects. And then uh, for those uh, projects, usually that's not going to be displayed on like a digital display of some kind or projection. So I've got into projection mapping somewhere along my career, which uh, has led me, you know on some really cool adventures. Um, I think one of the coolest things that uh, 
I can say that I did was um, the world championship for the indoor lacrosse tournaments was held in Syracuse and the Onondaga uh, or the Haudenosaunee and Onondaga nation where where they were going to host it with their team, the Iroquois. And uh, I got to do kind of their creation story uh, projection mapped all around the arena. So um, that was a really cool, you know, project that came of me dabbling and experimenting with animation and projection. That sounds super cool. Um, I'd love to see something like that. Um, what, how does tradition play a role in your contemporary art practice? And we'll kind of go in reverse order. Jonathan, I'll let you take that one first. How does tradition play a role in your contemporary art practice? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think that's a question that uh, <clears throat> could be asked to native artists, you know, since the beginning of time. Um, one thing for me, I think, uh, about going in reverse is tradition kind of went in reverse with my painting career because uh, I grew up in the Twin Cities, you know, I was a, a urban native and, you know, we had a very light uh, or I would say kind of like the abridged version, you know, of like understanding of tradition and teaching, uh, stuff like that. So, um, you know, I grew up kind of knowing like some Ojibwe words, like the funny ones or the dirty ones or, you know, like how to uh, say thank you and hello, you know, two very important ones to learn right away. <clears throat> but through my art career and research to create paintings and look for answers to these images, I've learned more about my Ojibwe heritage and uh, what that means about my world perspective. And I guess the more that I make art, the more that I figure out like what that looks like, you know, where I guess my platform and places in the world, like this, this piece right here, um, Jabakwe Gizis, uh, the cooking moon makes Mac. Oh, the cooking moon makes hangover Mac. <clears throat> so a few years back, I was, I was working with an organization here in Duluth called ACO, the American Indian Community Housing Organization. And annually they like to put out a calendar. So the Ojibwe calendar, uh, the months are kind of named after the moon, you know, which has, uh, relevance to what type type of year it is like um you know the wild rice harvesting moon or uh etc so it kind of made me think you know like what would my moon story look like and growing growing up hangover mac was kind of a sunday delicacy in our house so uh you know like in in the the sense of like contemporary tradition you know like contemporary like indigenous living and uh, I won't go as far as to say cuisine, but, you know, like just cooking, uh, that pot of Mac, you know, was sort of a regular thing in our house. And, um, this is sort of the, uh, creation story that came from it. I love it. Um, Jason, what are your thoughts? How does tradition play a role in your work? Well, with the imagery, for sure. Yeah. The animals, the clan animals. Uh, the strong women series that I've done, the putting floral designs and the seven grandfather teachings, even the material itself, I think, you know, there's a uh, traditional because it's stone. Another uh, way too is um, when I'm working on a piece, uh, I try to be very mindful of what I'm putting into it, what type of energy, like uh, thoughts, feelings, energy, even the message I'm trying to convey. Because I, I remember I was told by some elders, they were doing some beading and they're talking about how they try to, when they're working on that, what they're working on, they're trying to be mindful of what they're putting in there because those thoughts and them feelings will carry on to whoever it's going to. And then um, 
another little thing that I do is uh, it's on the last part of my sculptures, I'll do the sanding and the waxing. And so when I wax them, I'll do seven coats of wax. And each coat is like the seven grandfather teachings. There's love, respect, honesty, bravery, truth, and humility, wisdom. I don't, you know what? I might have that wrong, but anyways, I do put them seven grandfathers in there. I mean, you know, it's just, it's not necessary, but I just do it as a thing I do. So each sculpture that goes out has them thoughts and feelings in there. And then uh, on uh, that other note of uh, about putting a feeling and energy into a piece, um, they don't always have to be <laughs> like uh, good or good feeling or good energy. It could be uh, truth, kind of like what truth of what they see, like Jim Denemy's doing or Jonathan's work or Shirley's work with the are murdered and missing women. And, you know, it's that story that they're telling, you know, they want to put that truth out there. You know, and the, the storytelling, we're each telling them uh, a different story, different issues. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a nice segue into Shirley's work. I'll flip back through. So Shirley, your thoughts on that question. How does tradition play a role in your work? Probably the main thing is uh, the stories. Um, and I, I've done a lot of reading and research on the old legends and everything that's passed down. Some of us just been word of mouth. Some of us been stories that my mom told me when I was a little girl. But then some of the traditions are coming through to me somehow, like in, in a dream, like um, the reason I do these pots that are cut out, like you see this wolf, wolf one right here, it's bobcat or lynx. I had a dream and it's been years ago when I was still a student at Central Michigan University. And I was going out there with a group of about six other students and the teacher, we we're going to Wichita, Kansas for a pottery convention. And so we were taking turns driving and taking turns sleeping in the back and a little mattress. And when it was my turn to take a nap, I had this dream about this little pot and it was only about as big as a grapefruit with a little tiny collar on the top. And around that collar was a bunch of turtles standing and they were all cut out all the way through. And it was really primitive. I hadn't ever seen anything like that before. Um, they kind of looked almost Egyptian because they were so kind of flat, no, no roundness, no, no three-dimensional quality to them. But I, in my dream, I entered it into a contest and I won first place. And I said, oh my gosh, I won. And I looked around the van, like I'm thinking, oh my God, did I just say that out loud? And I thought, well, I, nobody was laughing. So I figured I'm, it was just part of my dream. And so when I got back to Michigan, I made that little pot and I actually took a picture of it luckily and um so that little pot is what this new all of this new stuff is evolved into and be, so there's the stories there's all this personal experience um and that dream and um i use a lot of like you see a lot of animals in my work and a lot of things from the great lakes because in a way i think the woodland indians are a little bit underrepresented uh nationwide as far as getting their art out there because when you say Indian pottery, everybody thinks Southwestern pottery. That's, that's kind of um, their big you know, claim to fame as far as the art goes. But actually Indians in Michigan made pottery too. Uh, we've picked, you know, we dug the clay from the rivers and, and fired it in our campfires. But the problem was it's so humid here and, and we didn't heat that up like we like I do in my kiln uh, to that temperature. So it, over the years, it disintegrated. So people don't walk around Michigan and find shards of pottery like they do out west. 
And another thing that I do that's kind of traditional is when I'm firing, even though I have an electric kiln and I do fire things outside too um, to get a different effect, but when I'm firing in my kiln, I always put down tobacco in the kiln and I say a little prayer and ask the creator for a, uh, you know, a good firing of those pieces and that they all come out fine and everything. So there's like tradition wove into my work. And, and as far as like, I like to see the people when they're looking at my work, whether it's a you know, three-dimensional or two-dimensional, I like to see their reaction when they see it. Like it, sometimes it's a little smile when they get the, there's a lot of jokes that go on in my work too, but if they get it, they'll be smiling, but some of this stuff is really um, poignant. And so you'll see a tear come to their eye. So when, when people, you know, react that way, I know I've done a good, I've done my job. Yeah, I mean, some of your work for sure deals with some heavy topics, which yeah. brings us to our next question. I know that Jason, you had some uh, specific thoughts. Um, so I'll just jump into that question. What sort of issues specific to your community do you <coughs> explore in your work? Um, and me being a, a non-native person, um, I want to invite Jonathan and Shirley, as each of you are sharing your thoughts on this question, to jump in with follow-up questions if anything comes to mind. Um, but Jason, I'll let you kick it off. What, is, what sort of issues specific to your community do you explore in your work? Um, uh, revitalization and resilience. <coughs> uh, right now in our native communities, especially mine, there's a resurgence of our old ways, old ways, knowledge, uh, language, ceremonies, traditional foods, uh, healing, how to gather those foods, all that was lost. And, you know, it's coming back. Even nowadays, you see more children getting Anishinaabe names. When I was growing up, that wasn't around. Also, um, like some of the ceremonial ways, I didn't do my first sweat till I was 18. Uh, first 40 fast till my late 30s. And yeah, just so much was lost in my community, especially. You know, that, and be much of that was lost due to the genocide and warfare, murder, broken treaties, and government policies set to wipe us out. Because at the time, the white society wanted to wanted our land and resources to enrich themselves. Uh, for example, one of them policies, which I feel is the worst, is the residential boarding school era from uh, 1867 to 1986. And the model for those uh, institutions was uh, to kill, kill the Indian, save the man. And I'd say it was the most destruct, I think it was the most destructive because it hit the indigenous people at the core. Our family is, was, is our core now and that was then. And like all of the other atrocities that had happened to us, we were, we were able to weather because we still had our families intact. We had those uh, ceremonies and practices that we were able to cope with, you know, like smoking the pipe, fasting and all that stuff. And, you know, this, Despite all that, because of that time and the loss that happened, um, our communities, everything's coming back. You know, the resilience and uh, revitalization, you know, the old ways coming back. And I feel my work is a part of it. You know, just the imagery that I do, you know, one, it's one of the reasons I started carving large monumental granite sculptures was uh, so our stories would be here for thousands of years. They'll be sitting there out in the weather, you know, for generations. 
So that's kind of what I hit, what I work with, you know, what I think about when I'm doing my work. Thanks. Um, and then Jonathan and Shirley, I'll open it up to either of you, whomever wants to jump in and address that question next. Um, I've got a couple of things here as far as um, the issues that that Native women face. Um, it's It's been so hush hush. Uh, several years ago, I was talking to a group of women in my little hometown and I said something about the missing and murdered women that was going to be in my next piece of artwork and they they were you know dumbfounded they didn't know what I was talking about and actually there's at, at least recorded close to 6000 women that have you know been part of this issue and and it says here um, four out of five native women have been involved in violence against themselves um, that's 84% of all native women today i mean that's outrageous um, and it says uh, Native women are more than 10 times the average to be murdered, you know, nationwide, uh, class wise, race wise, 10 times. And it's also said that homicide is like the third leading cause of death among Native women from the age of 10 to 24. I mean, is, is, you know, so some of my art, I want people to understand this and realize it. And a lot of these women, even though they've been reported, um, they've never they've never had groups of people or authorities going out looking for them. So it's it's sort of just a thing that's been hush hush for many many years. So and I I did want to say the thing about the red um, the red hands and and the red dresses though. Um, that's been sort of a, a calling card that we use to uh, get people's attention and the red hand across the face is it symbolizes that um, secrecy that that hush hush thing that that people have put on this whole issue so I, I just wanted to have others you know be aware maybe somebody out there can come up with something to you know to help this situation go away so that's I feel really deeply about that yeah, I think that that's reflected in your work too. I think your work is both beautiful and also really haunting. Um, what's the response like in the native community, especially among women when you share this work with them? Is it raising awareness? Is it helping to start? Yeah, because yeah, I really believe it is. And there's a lot of things going around. You'll see a lot of things on Facebook and uh, on the news where women get together now and we're you know trying to arm ourselves mentally about how to not be another victim so I think it I think it is helping that's great Jonathan we're, we're getting into some heavy issues so I'm curious to know your thoughts especially since your work has uh, elements of humor built into it um, what's your take on this how do you address issues within the indigenous community um, yeah, I, uh, I would have to say that <clears throat> everything that uh, was touched on here is something that at some point uh, I meditated on and created work about and uh, I get involved, I guess, uh, with other artists and storytellers and filmmakers who um, are making work about this. You know, and then I guess I'll take the role as sort of the visual uh, interpreter for that stuff. Um, with the works that are in the gallery there, uh, I guess uh, Jason mentioned revitalization. And uh, that's what the doctrine of rediscovery image is about. <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, when I created it, I was thinking a lot about the language, uh, the Ojibwe language work, you know, that uh, I get asked to be a part of throughout the year as an illustrator, um, just to teach that stuff and make it available, you know, make content that's available to <clears throat> learners of all ages, you know, because I'm, I'm still learning it. That introduction in Ojibwe that I said at the beginning of the uh, 
call. I'm pretty sure I didn't mess that up, but uh, that's not something, you know, that I had as a kid because, uh, <clears throat> you know, these, uh, these things like uh, relocation and uh, the boarding school generation, the Indian uh, Religious Freedom Act um, is pretty new. Uh, so I think it was like a year old when it was finally legal, you know, for uh, indigenous people to practice their, you know, their ways and be themselves, <clears throat> which is a big reason why, you know, I've sort of reverse engineered my Ojibwe identity through my art throughout my life. You know, I'm not going to claim that, you know, I've been knowing all this stuff because I haven't you know, it wasn't there for me. So uh, <clears throat> that piece, um, you know, it speaks to uh, toppling monuments, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, big sort of religious sculpture in this in the piece is kind of crumbling. Something that we've seen in 2020, you know, the toppled monuments. So uh, that was really interesting uh, to see the cans of Kamad food, you know, that's that's government issued food. And one thing that we're seeing, uh, my wife, in fact, is uh, she's a major advocate for indigenous food systems, you know, and like reclaiming our diet and eating the things that, you know, are more natural to us to make us feel 100%. Um, and then the, uh, the little baby, you know, the sort of the little cosmonaut, uh, ch indigenous cherub or whatever you want to call it is uh you know that's sort of us that's that's our generation you know that's our generation kind of having a choice you know and this uh this elder with uh the red markers you know that's uh that's us having a choice to to choose that path or you know to choose any path really but it's just nice that we have that option now so uh, a lot of these are very interpretive, you know, which is probably, it's probably good that I'm here to explain them. And then uh, one of the things that uh, reoccurs in my, th my artwork is these red um, pieces of fabric, which are like, uh, they're path markers, you know, to me, they they signify path markers to find, to find your way, you know, to find your way back or find your way home or find the best you that you can, you can be um, in a country in a system that is designed around erasing you and uh, making you feel like if you weren't here, we wouldn't have to acknowledge some of these things that we did. So uh, that's kind of the gist of how I approach these things. And sometimes they're more serious, but uh, sometimes, you know, I got to go with a little bit of humor just to kind of keep, keep my audience's attention keep my own personal sanity. You know, I remember in college, the, uh, the teacher that I paid attention to the most was the one that could make me chuckle every five minutes or 10 minutes throughout the lecture, not the one that would put me to sleep. So it's kind of my approach to that. Sure, for sure. Yeah, you <coughs> gotta keep people actually looking at your work long enough to get what it is you're trying to say. One of the questions or the comments in the chat that came through, I think is relevant as we're looking at this because of the little figure sort of down below the statue with the red tie. Um, we've got a couple individuals wondering how you are all, uh, let me pull it up, I'll read it word for word. Um, lost it. How you've been dealing with the former president and also uh, with COVID, so really just current events, what are your thoughts, your responses artistically or otherwise to those things? Hmm. <laughs> Big question. Who's first? <clears throat> so if you look at the little uh, rag doll in the painting here, um, you'll see somebody uh, who might resemble a former president. Oh, no. <clears throat> and the water is really black, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like oil. Um, Jason and I were talking a little bit about this earlier, the whole Standing Rock uh, situation that happened a while back. And um, 
I, I was there a couple times just to uh, be a supporting, you know, role, I guess, and try to go there in a good way, you know, and bring my prayers and uh, good thoughts and stuff. And <clears throat> as soon as this president came into, uh, you know, his presidency, I don't know if it was a week, you know, and he just kind of squashed any progress that the, the uh, pipeline protests had made and just bulldozed over the whole thing. So right away, you know, I will say for me personally that um, that was a bad first impression. And first impressions are everything to me. So ever since then, uh, I just keep doing what I do. You know, Ojibwe uh, and indigenous communities, um, when you immerse yourself, you know, there's an there's a whole community, there's a, an, an economy you know, and when you pay attention, for me, I, I just paid attention to the things that I could, I could do, you know, which is help those in my community and help uh, the people that were around me. And uh, I will say that uh, the four years, it, it was kind of like watching reality TV anytime I turned on the news. But uh the community that I sort of centered myself in, you know, the Ojibwe community around here, we sort of just kept doing our own thing and, and we're still alive. I'm still here. I'm still making art, you know, I'm still telling stories and uh, still making bad jokes. So I don't know. What can you say? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll keep moving through our questions unless Jason or Shirley would like to jump in on that one, current event specific. Well, what I've noticed about myself is a lot of people have been complaining about having to stay home, but I've been doing exactly the same thing, COVID or not, by just, I'm always home just doing my art anyhow. So um, it's, it's that part of it has not been a um, detriment to my creativity or to my being alone or anything like that, because that's what I do anyhow. So I didn't notice it a whole lot. Um, the only thing I really miss is my grandkids. So, and, and my son, so. Yeah, family, for sure. Yeah, family. Yeah, Jason, same with me. Yeah. Um, my studio, I'm, I'm there alone a lot, so. Yeah. And I've been busy pretty much through the whole thing and then I was I got to say about the uh, orange asshole is I'm glad he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the thing that did kind of, I guess, bum me out or whatever, um, is all my big art shows. I go to Santa Fe and, and that was canceled and um, Indianapolis, the Idle George, they were virtual. So that was good. Um, and I, you know, got a few things on the online and everything just because of that. But, and then I missed seeing my, my other art artists because we've kind of become a big family. You know, you get to see somebody every few months and, you know, sat, safe travels down the road. And so I haven't been able to see anybody like this whole year as far as the other artists goes. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of artist communities are feeling that, that sort of vacuum. Yeah. Uh, which kind of brings us to our next question about what influences your work. Maybe it's other artists, um, but tell us, and we didn't really designate a single person to kick this one off. So I'll open it up to all of you, but tell us about what influences your work, what other artists you look to, or just in general, what does your creative process look like? Hmm. Let's see. All right, all right. <laughs> so I'll start off with the, the creative process. So it depends on what I'm doing. So sometimes I'll say I'm doing a monumental piece and it's, I got to order this stone. So I'll order it from a, a quarry. I think one I got, it was, came from Canada and there was three, 4,000 pound pieces. I had to get them shipped to the studio and then I had to have a 
a forklift, get them out of a big semi, heavy duty forklift too, and then bring them in the studio. And uh, it was granite. So, and then they, they was all going to stand on top of each other. So when it was done, it was going to be 16 feet tall, 12,000 pounds. And so I had to kind of map it all out and glue it, glue it all together. And yeah, just a lot of, a uh, lot of drawing and grinding on my creative process. And maybe on some of the, the other questions too, I think, what was it? Uh, do you look to other people's work? Uh, yeah, I do look at other people's work a lot. Nowadays on Instagram, that's where I found a lot of artists for the show is via Instagram and Facebook. And yeah, just looking at their work uh, really uh, inspires me. You know, you see some good work on there and you just think, damn, I can't believe they made that or, you know, the skill and the beauty it just inspires you. So I do enjoy looking at other people's work. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned um, a little bit about how you physically get those massive blocks into your studio. I think all of us kind of wonder about that mm -hmm. from time to time. Um, and then also Instagram, right? So there's sort of this back and forth through this conversation, we're talking about traditions and heritage, um, but then, you know, a lot of networking for artists, contemporary artists happens online. And so I think it's interesting yeah. that those connections among indigenous people between tribes is happening in this really new sort of way. Um, I wanna take just a second to bring into the conversation Dylan Miner, and I'm searching through, oh, I think I saw him just now, nope. Um, and I probably at some point told Dylan the wrong time. So oh. he logged on a little bit late, uh, but we're very happy to have him. Oh my gosh, I cannot find you. Just a moment. Well, I'm looking for Dylan. Hey, Dylan. Connor, surely. I see him. You see yeah. him? Hello. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, my biggest apologies, particularly to Shirley, uh, Jason, and Jonathan. I had seven o'clock and I was here <laughs> a few minutes early. So I, I, my biggest apologies for- Yeah, on your time, right here early. So yeah. to recap, um, we're down to, oh, the fourth question we're talking about influences and what other artists they look at. Um, I think I would love for you to briefly introduce yourself to the rest of our group here. Um, and then I'll extend my apologies for on behalf of us and, and everyone um, that we're having Dylan join late. But we're so grateful to have you. And I'm so sorry that this is a bit of an awkward moment. So can you please um, tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself? Muted. Great, sorry, trying to unmute myself, but it, it, it's hard to do it in a space like this. We need the uh, host's uh, <clears throat> approval. Um, so uh, again, thanks for uh, letting me join you. My name is Dylan Miner. Um, I, I direct the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program at Michigan State University. I'm seeing some wonderful faces of people I know here. Um, I'm trained as an art historian and also a practicing artist, and I'm a, a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario. And I'm calling in from uh, East Lansing, which is on 1819 Treaty of Saginaw Territory. Thank you, Dylan. Um, so I'll we'll just sort of all chime in uh, to the conversation at this point. Um, since we're on that fourth question, uh, Shirley, Jonathan, and, and I'll just call out Shirley to start us off. What influences your work or what other artists do you look at? What kind of things are you thinking about in your process? Um, as far as other artists, um, I have a few 
potters that I've met, you know, and we've been good close friends for like 30 years or something. And I've met at different shows. And when you sit next to somebody at a booth for the weekend show, you become pretty good friends and start knowing their history and, and sharing stories back and forth. But everybody's art is so different because all my, um, my art, my pottery friends uh, do a different kind. They, they dig their own clay. They fire outside all the time. Mine is inside. I, I use a, um, a store-bought clay, um, electric kiln. And, um, but I noticed that what they're doing as far as you know, following their traditional ideas and images and stuff in their work. And I'm doing the same thing. And I try to keep um, the woodland theme going in my work, um, which you can see it because uh, we were so full of vines and flowers and you know flora and fauna from this area. And that's what you see in my work. So um, that's kind of been my influence is just living in, in Michigan. Thank you. Jonathan, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think uh, early on, I was inspired by uh, surrealist painters. Um, I really like artwork that comes out of Mexico. Uh, having studied in Santa Fe, I think my color palette kind of stuck a little bit from when I was down there. But um, inspiration wise, I'd have to say that, uh, you know, something that Shirley touched on about going down to the market. <clears throat> Whenever I go to one of these major art hubs, you know, where there's like a market going on and I see all the different artists and I see what they're creating. It's, it's almost like, uh, you know, like sharpening my sword or something, you know, because I just it just lights that fire for me, you know, and it, it just lets me know that there are people, there are artists out there who are working, who are really hard to uh, bring their craft, you know, to that world-class level. <clears throat> and for me, uh, that's a huge inspiration. Um, I watch a lot of movies. I like to go to film festivals. Uh, I'm looking forward to when we can go to film festivals again, you know, but that type of uh, independent storytelling, you know, has a huge impact on me, not only in uh, the experimental or short films that I make, digital canvases, but also the way that I construct my canvases too. Um, just trying to make characters interesting and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, or else, sometimes I'll name a painting after uh, one of my favorite songs or like, you know, listen to a lot of Tom Waits. Um, that's, uh, you know, that type, that sort of uh, mood, that setting, you know, is something that's good for me and kind of, kind of fuels me, you know, when I'm creating. So I guess if I had to say, you know, that's probably where some of the areas that I draw from. Um, I subscribe to Juxtapose Magazine, uh, High Fructose, you know, those are good places for me to just see kind of outside the box thinkers. Um, and I, I keep in touch, you know, with a lot of artists from like, uh, Santa Fe all over the place, you know, just to see what everybody's working on, just to make sure I'm plugged in and I'm still challenging, you know, myself and my dialogue and, uh, keeping in touch, you know, with issues and trying to keep my finger on the pulse that way. Yeah. I want to pause here and, um, just acknowledge that we're coming up on seven. So if anyone is here with a clear 7 p.m. end time. Thank you so much for joining us. We understand if you have to take off, but I also invite everyone, if you have the time to stick around and continue the conversation. So um, so Dylan, I'll let you take the last <laughs> question that we had on our list. Great, we're up to number five, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, I guess I'll start with, uh, with you, Shirley, and, and, and wonder if you could talk a little bit about your actual creative process and what goes into the making of your work. Um, and just to throw a little uh, uh, a curveball in our conversation here versus what we uh, uh, talked about the other day, since I'm already throwing lots of curveballs by throwing up an hour, showing up an hour late. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk about your what goes into your creative process, but then also um, 
how COVID and the pandemic has shifted how, uh, how you've been able to work and if you've been able to respond to some of those changes. Yeah, we kind of covered a little bit of that about the COVID um, and I'll, I'll just mention it again for you. Um, <laughs> mostly, mostly I, I've been doing exactly the same thing that I would have been doing a year ago, which is just spending time down in my studio by myself. Um, and the only thing that really hurt was not having those big art markets to go to. Um, that's, that's a big uh, income crusher, I guess. But um, for, as far as my creative process, like if I'm throwing pottery on the wheel, there's a whole bunch of steps that have to go, you know, that I have to go through, you know, like Jason was saying, ordering the supplies, driving up to Northern Michigan to pick up my clay, um, bringing it back home, um, throwing it on the wheel, making the pots and then trimming it, hooking it together. And then, and as I sit there and look at it, um, that's kind of sometimes where I get what, what needs to go on that piece. Um, so I start carving and I try to embellish it with um, things that are important to me, um, different animals, different, you know, the different stories come out, they pop out. Um, I, there's, there's a couple of really good ones. Um, I was working for the Kalamazoo Art Institute and Planetarium a few years ago, well, several, several years ago, and they wanted a pot, uh, how, well, a piece of art that said, how does the stars get in the sky? And so they gave me a script and I read it and it was just like, it just piqued my imagination. So I started carving this piece that um, tells the entire story as you spin the pot around. And so um, I get a lot of, you know, the stories are the important part for my, for my work, whether it's like two dimensional or three dimensional, but I'm also a writer. So I've, you know, taken some of the things that I've written and put them into the pots. Thanks, Shirley. Jason, did you want to respond to to talk a little bit about? I know in the last question, and uh, you did talk a little bit about the the process, um, but uh, talk yeah. about your actual creative process. Yeah, so I talked a little bit about the monumental stuff, but around my studio, like I have the my commissions that I'm working on, but I also have like several other pieces just sitting around on tables. A lot of times I'll move stones around and just look at them, just set them up. So when I'm walking by them throughout the day, some, day, some days it just hits you. You see a design and you got to you gotta go for it. And so that's why I have, it's one of my processes. Uh, another thing too is um, the stone. The stone itself kind of uh, inspires me. It uh, influences the work that I'm doing, say the color, the shape, or, you know, just different stuff. What was the other part of the question? <laughs> if, if, if there was a, a potentially a changes based on uh, the, the, the pandemic, how has that impacted your time in the studio, your creative process? I know many folks are having a much more difficult time focusing. Yeah, it, um, it didn't affect me too much. I'm alone in my studio a lot, so I was able to work. Even when they told us we couldn't work, I was there alone and I went down there anyways. No one knew <laughs> I was there. I guess, I could remember when the pandemic first hit, um, I had to go pick up a 7,500 pound block of limestone down in Indiana. And I remember they say, no, you can't travel after this, this date. And I was like, damn, that's really gonna set me back. So I just took off, I took off like at five in the morning drove down to Indiana. It wasn't that bad. It was kind of a nice drive, but I can remember being real paranoid about, oh, am I going to get pulled over or something? Hauling a big stone coming home. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, other than that, you know, um, I had quit doing the shows for, for the past 
for quite a while now. I haven't done Indian Market or any of those other shows. But I've been doing a lot of uh, public commissions, and I was pretty fortunate on getting getting one before the shit hit the fan, basically. And so it kind of carried me through. I was real grateful for that. So, but I don't know how the future looks now, you know? It's one thing with the art artists, we, it's feast or famine a lot of times. And, you know, when I'm done with this project and if things don't pick up, I don't know what's going to come through, you know? I will see. <laughs> I, I did notice that uh, uh, Lynn in the comments said that you start every day, uh, or at least uh, you shared uh, with with folks on social media, you start every day at the water. Uh, I've seen that as well. So mm -hmm. it seems like an important part of, at least uh, from the outside, an important part of your working process. And uh, Oh, yeah. It also seems all like about you have that. a good cigar as well. <laughs> yeah. At least one a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, how do you approach, uh, what, what's your working process? How do you go from an empty canvas to kind of your, your complex, complicated, beautiful paintings? Uh, I would say it kind of just starts as, uh, I, I'm a visual thinker, so um, I just kind of get these images <clears throat> and I'll try to figure out, you know, like, all right, what's my brain trying to tell me? And uh, if it's interesting enough, I'll either write it down or I'll make a sketch. And then eventually um, I'll have, you know, like some little partial sketches or uh, just a little list of notes crumpled up around my desk here. <clears throat> and then uh, sometimes those will go on to a larger sketch. And then from there, I'll go on to the canvas and uh, during that time, usually I'll just be sort of playing with colors and shapes and textures just to kind of get things moving and then uh, start to fill them in, you know, with some of the, I guess, some of the ideas that I have sketched down that are better, in my opinion, for, you know, whatever that's going to be. Um, just as long as, you know, it's sort of not too far out of left field from whatever that canvas is about to be. <clears throat> I would say occasionally, uh, occasionally I'll get, you know, sort of like writer's block when it comes to painting, but really um, if I just start, if I just put like a piece of paper and a pencil together, it goes away almost immediately. I just have to do, you know, that part, make one line and then something will start happening. And I guess there, there are times where I'll make a whole canvas and, uh, you know, as long as you sort of make your truth, you paint your truth, you know, you just paint the things that you know, you know, it's always going to be the right answer. <clears throat> and then I'll look at the canvas when it's done or when it's like almost done and try to figure out, you know, what does it mean to me? So those types of stories end up being more like vignettes, you know, rather than you know, like a whole story about something, it's almost like a glimpse into a uh, part of a story or like an action, you know, that is significant of something. And then there are other things happening that uh, I will sort of keep somewhat of, intu of an intuitive nature so that the viewer can kind of help me tell the story or like make up their own mind about what's happening, sort of invite them to be a part of the process in that way. I kind of do that too, like when, um... I'll get orders for pots or, or drawings. And I like to have the people involved with helping me design it. Like um, I, I, I did one for myself. It was called Family Spirits. And there were the animals that represent different people in my family and um, different images and stuff. And so when I showed it to a friend, she wanted me to make one for her son with his images in there. So she gave me a big list of things that she wanted in the painting or in the drawing. And so I did that. But um, I'm always trying to e keep evolving. Um, like I mentioned that I throw pots on the wheel, but I also do a lot of slab work. And so I've been creating these big square boxes that I carve. I think there's one in the in the show. But um, and I put sometimes I put stained glass inside. 
Sometimes I put big boxes of clear glass with drawings inside the boxes. And so that you have to take the lid off in order to see what, you know, what's inside. But I think that's part of the thing by when, when I'm looking at other people's art, other, other potters, I'm thinking, oh, how did they come up with that? It's so cool. And then I'll come home and I'll try something along those lines, but in my own version. So yeah, that's trying to just evolve the whole time. Would it be all right if I turn to a couple of questions from the audience before uh, we wrap things up? Um, sure. Is Absolutely. that cool, folks? Yeah. Awesome. I've been uh, looking at the comments here. There's been a couple of, of uh, great ones in the side. And I'm going to kind of scrolling back up to, to when I first came in. And this one comes from uh, an individual who, who teaches at the college level and, and works with students. Um, and they want to know, how would you suggest non-Native students engage with our Indigenous communities? And also, as part of that, what are your perspectives on non-Native students who would like to engage in traditional motifs without disrespecting the culture in which they come from? I, I think that's fine um, because they're interpreting what they see. I, I remember when I went out to Santa Fe the first night I got to Santa Fe and I was only in my twenties, I guess. Um, I had this dream and, and it was about, there were kachinas around me and they were kind of very vivid. It was really realistic. So the next day when I went to class, I sketched that out because the teacher said we had to have a painting done by the following week. So I sketched it out and I showed everybody and it was the Hopi Kachinas and all the, all the students said, oh, you can't do that because that's part of our religion. You know, you're not a Hopi, you can't be drunk. I said, I'm not trying to do anything against your religion or, you know, step on anybody's toes. I'm trying to interpret my dream. And so I did the painting. Um, from that aspect. So I, that's, that's my take on it. You know, that's an interesting sh uh, story, Shirley. I was, um, I was down in Santa Fe on a residency and I was talking to a group of students, some of which were Hopi. And I just said, you know, I just gotta say, I really love you guys as aesthetic. I just wish that without being called out on appropriation that I could borrow some <laughs> of it for my paintings. And uh, one guy came up, he said, hey, don't worry about it. Go ahead, you can have it. And uh, I said, shake on it. So we shook on it. <laughs> and everybody's <laughs> laughing during this time, of course. Uh, Just joking. Well, what was, this what was kind of funny with me on, in my drawing, there was this, the kachinas were floating above my, or above my body. And I was also sort of levitating in the painting. And um, there was a big archway behind me and back home, where I came from in Indiana, there was a big archway like that. And those kids told me, they said, no, don't do it because something's gonna happen. And sure enough, the friend back home called me and said that his archway fell over that night. So I thought, well, they were right, but. Don't mess with the kachinas. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. <laughs> Yeah, tell the students, don't do kachinas. <laughs> um, if I could follow that up with one more, um, this one uh, comes from a, a, a poet friend of ours, and it, it asks, um, for all the artists, what role does your art play in healing for you and or your family and or your community? So what role, what's the relationship for you for art and healing? Uh, I'll start out with that one. Uh, for me, uh, like my story, when I started doing this, I, I also was in, uh, started like in the addiction. So I was 14 when I started doing this work. And then I went on a 10 year odyssey of heavy drug use and alcohol abuse. And I was stuck, stuck in it real deep and this work, even when I was in it, I was still doing this work. And I could remember finish, finishing work to go buy crack and stuff like that. And I could remember when I was ready to quit, it was tough, but I had had enough. It was this work that I do that saved my life. Kind of healed me because when you quit them substances, you're missing 
you have something missing from your your life basically from your mind there's like a big hole and so this work kind of filled that hole and then it's fed me and clothed me over the years and let me express myself it's, it's definitely healing I had a little cat that I had for 14 years. He was part bobcat. And one night he just never showed up again. And I thought the, the coyotes around my house probably killed him because they eat like 20% of their diet is cat. So um, I was really sad about it. And I had called my son and I said, oh my God, I can't get over this sad feeling. I know those coyotes killed him and stuff. And he goes, mom, don't think of him like that. Think of it like he was a warrior cat and he went out fighting and that was his last battle. And when he said that, it totally changed my image of the sadness that I was keeping inside. So I made, I did a drawing, it's called Into the Fray. And there's a bobcat in the center of the drawing and there's wolves all the way around him. And, and then there's a quote, into the fray, I must go to live or die on this day. And I found out that that was a quote from Shakespeare. And I actually write that on the drawings when I get them when I get them done. But it helped me it helped me get over that sadness that that I was feeling. Thanks, Shirley. Jonathan, do you have any any thoughts on this one? Yeah, uh, I, I would say that um, on a personal level, uh, creating uh, artwork is like a meditative process for me. So. Yeah. You know, when um, the news and social media and everything starts getting really wild, you know, and I can't like stop thinking about what's going on. <clears throat> it's nice to just do some hard work, you know, work on a canvas or, you know, try to make something on my computer. And uh, for me, that really has always, since I can remember, helped me keep me centered. And uh <clears throat> You know, as far as uh, helping heal the community, um, I think uh, the, just the work that we're creating, as long as, you know, like members of our community can see themselves in it or identify with it um, and feel heard or at least feel like they're, they're seeing something that is important to them, you know, that's a form of healing too because you know, then we're, we're kind of all in it together. And that community is something that I found through my art. You know, like when I, when I first started making art, I didn't know if I just wanted to draw like scary skateboards or something all my life. And I had no clue. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So uh, through my career, I have found myself um, as an active part of my community uh, doing things that are good for my community and that's not anything that I ever would imagine you know happening like as a kid when I was just like I'm going to art school <laughs> you know I just thought that I was just going to go learn how to draw good and I don't know be some emo painter like slapping paint around in a warehouse studio somewhere by himself but you can't you can't really uh you know do stuff I would say that not every piece of work that I make, you know, is like a huge statement because that would be exhausting. But uh, when I when I can say something, you know, that's good. It feels good, and that's good medicine for me. But scary uh, yeah, that that no. resonated with me. The not every piece I make is like gut wrenching or you know so emotional. So sometimes I have to put in some of the fun stuff in between just to to carry, to balance out things. Yeah. Yeah, I also want to thank Jason for sharing that story. You know, that's that's something that is uh, part of my life too. I remember, um, you know, back in my my drinking days, it was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch a canvas like when it was at sort of like the 90% mark, you know, everything up to that was just like, you know, there was boxes of wine and like whiskey bottles in the, all the paint drawers and stuff. And then when I that started to get to that last 10%, I would just make sure that I wouldn't, you know, touch that stuff to finish up. 
and then eventually I just realized that, you know, I just got to put the old plug in the jug and my artwork will be way more refined. And, you know, as a, as a professional artist, you know, I'll be able to show up for more and, uh, post that decision, my artwork has definitely helped keep me sane. You know, it's really, uh, it's a drug and it's addicting, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great way to make money. It's how I pay my bills and <clears throat> it's how this light right here is, uh, staying on. But, uh, you know, it's also, it's just like my number one drug of choice. That's for sure. Yeah. There was one more question in the comments. Could we get to that uh, before we end up, Amanda, or should we uh, kind of? I'm, I'm here for the duration. I will say um, for anyone that does need to take off, I'm just putting up a little link to future events at the gallery and just want to say a quick thanks. But yes, please continue the conversation. And if I'm involved in future events, I will continue to show up an hour late for them. So and then they'll go an extra half an hour just because you're here. <laughs> uh, great. So uh, this is this is a question. I think it's, it's a good one. I think it would, will allow us to kind of uh, look forward and kind of transition um, out of, of the conversation. But it's a question um, that comes from uh, Alyssa uh, Brandel Chamberlain, which asks, uh, asks you to talk a little bit about how you pass on your skills and passion to future generations. And if you're doing anything kind of to kind of work with, uh, to share your art making with family members, or do you teach or have uh, uh, anyone else working with you? How do you work to kind of share your knowledge with uh, kind of with others? I do all of the above. I started out with, um, uh, my oldest granddaughter is like 28, I think now. When she was just a tiny little girl, I have a drawer in my studio that's just kid stuff, rounded scissors, paper, glue sticks. And now they're doing pottery and I have now her daughter, which is my great granddaughter, sitting on my lap doing pottery. And I've taught thousands of people, not just, not just uh, elementary or high school or college, but senior citizens as well all over the whole country, far away as Alaska. And um, so I, I've made that kind of one of my goals is to just, just pass this on. And I don't hold back any information. Like some of my friends, oh, I can't tell you how I make that glaze because it's my secret glaze. But I tell everybody everything. So that's how it's gonna be, you know, spared for the future, so. Yeah, uh, I'm the same way, you know, especially with uh, sharing, you know, I'm willing to share everything that I have. Uh, there's no secrets. Also, I like to pass it on. Uh, I've taken up uh, maybe not hundreds, but uh, quite a few apprentices over the years of people who just want to try it, you know especially natives. Um, I could remember my, my mentor telling me, you know, uh, you need to pass this on to natives, share it with them and keep it going. So I try not to, uh, not too many people have stuck, but you know, it's nice when they come in and they want to learn, you know, cause they get a stone and they think, well, what am I going to do with this? You know, and the way I work is I don't do the old hammer and chisel method. It's all like heavy duty power tools. So when they're learning, they're jumping right in with heavy duty power tools. And, you know, some of them take to it. I got a guy right now. He's, he comes in every day, you know, due to COVID. Uh, he got furloughed. He's a native guy. And yeah, I just said, hey man, come on in and hang out and smoke cigars. And he carves stone. I show him whatever I can and he just kind of picks it up on his own. And yeah, so I think it's very important to pass this on. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh 
if somebody is, you know, they, they're curious about, you know, what I'm up to, I'll, I'll share. Um, I don't know about my painting. I, I don't know if there's a lot of mystery to that, but uh, I, I've shared uh, some of my digital uh, experience with um, this year. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a couple programs where it's kind of like a cohort and I'm the mentoring artist in uh, kind of the digital artistry end of things because I think that's something that, you know, is, is there's more of a call for it, especially, you know, during the, this COVID era, you know, like if you can uh, use digital tools to share your artwork uh, farther and wider, you know, I think that's something that's <clears throat> being welcomed by, you know, a lot of people that I'm, I'm seeing partner up around here, you know, in uh, Minnesota. And uh, I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll be truthful and say that when I was asked, you know, kind of like share all my tips and stuff with people, I was thinking, oh boy, uh, yeah, sure, I'll do it, why not? You know, like <laughs> I would love to see more people kind of like venture into that sort of half digital realm and just see a lot more of that. And there is, you know, like surprisingly there, there really is and it's just so good to see that community there, you know, and not be, you know, like stingy with that or anything like that. So, um, and uh, I, I think, you know, it, it can only, it can only help like in the broad sense of community, but um, they say that when you teach something, you know, then you really probably should learn that thing, or you should know it really well and if you don't, after you teach it, you'll probably know it twice as good as you did before. So it's helped me quite a bit. Given some online tutorials on how to do like After Effects animation, you know, with still imagery. And uh, it just taught me so much about like how much I actually mess up during the process and then have to fix it, you know, and like try to be creative and get it back on track and uh, make it look good. Yeah, that's true about the teaching thing. Like when you're showing somebody, you really realize what you're doing, what you're not doing to your full potential. Or at least you better look like you know what you're doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been a, a mentor for two students um, over the years, just recently from Zebu Wing Center there in Mount Pleasant. And as much as I've helped them out, they've turned around and now they're helping me out with different things. I mean, their expertise, you know, with the computers and um, marketing and things like that, that they're turning right back around. And, you know, they came down and one girl did a video thing with me for Santa Fe. And yeah, so they, they're returning that mentor apprenticeship thing, right, you know, full force. Thank you. Were you a part of that whole uh, kind of like 3D world that the Santa Fe art market put on this year? Yeah. That was cool. Yeah. That was so cool. Yeah. In fact, the pot that's in the show, the missing and murdered sisters pot, um, got a first place uh, in the pottery. And it also got a, the, the new award. It was current issues. And so, I, you know, it was a surprise to me when they named me for that. Yeah, so I was part of that digital thing. Oh, that's great. Congratulations on that, Shirley. And thanks to the three of you um, for your comments there. And before I kick it back to Amanda, I just wanted to thank each of you for rolling with the um, uh, <laughs> my <laughs> absence. And, um, you know, what, what I think that, you know, your comments and your work in particular demonstrate is that particularly in a moment of, uh, of such as we're living through with the pandemic, that the role of the artist is a crucial one in both uh, indigenous societies and in your Anishinaabeg societies, but also within our larger society. That a lot of people have needed the role of the artist and the poet and the musician in this way to help them through this pandemic. And so I just wanna thank you for your beautiful work, for your work that engages with difficult topics, for that engages in, in, in creating new form that forces us to, to question various things in the, in the painting, in the stone, in the ceramic or drawing. So um, 
always been a fan of the three of your work and, and thanks so much for what you do. And I'll kick it back to Amanda. And thank you, Amanda, for organizing this. Thank you, Dylan, for those closing thoughts and for joining us. And again, apologies to you and to everyone for um, sort of the, the mismatch up, up front in the program. Um, a thank you so much to Jason and Shirley and Jonathan and a quick shout out to the handful of the other artists in the exhibition that joined us. Um, I hope that everyone who is able to come to GVSU or to Muskegon to actually see the show, I hope that you do before the end of February. You can visit the, the various websites to see when the hours are. Um, I'll just quickly mention that Grand Valley's gallery is open late on Thursday, so you could come in tomorrow between 1 and 7 and see the work in person. It's very, very powerful. And of course, thank you to everyone who's still with us on this call for sticking it out to the end. I hope that you enjoyed um, everything that was shared tonight. We will put this recording on our YouTube channel, so if you want to come back and visit anything, look for GVSU Art on YouTube. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, to the artist thank again, you. and thank you to Dylan. And that'll close thank our program. Much. Have a lovely evening, thank everyone. You. All Take right, care. miigwech. Miigwech. Bama P. Bama, Bama P. Bama.